Okay, we'll make a start. We're running a few minutes late, but uh, hopefully that's okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. David Oliver, and David is an honorary professor here at the Tizard Centre, um, and he is also a, was a full-time consultant in palliative medicine, but still part-time? Part-time-ish, part -time -ish. not very much now. Still. And he is also a visiting professor at universities in Zagreb and in Australia. David has um, many years' experience in the field of, of palliative care and particularly for people with uh, motor neuron disease and other neurological uh, diseases, but he also has an interest in um, end-of-life care for people with learning disabilities, which is what he's going to be talking uh, to us about uh, this afternoon. So I'll hand over to David, he'll, he'll give his talk and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and any kind of discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for asking me to give a seminar today. As, as I said, I've been a consultant of palliative medicine for 32 years. I always start say I started very young, so that's why it was 32 years. And over the last few years, I've been working particularly with Rachel Forrester-Jones, looking at palliative care and end-of-life care in learning disability. And what I'd like to do today is talk through a little bit about some of the studies and things that have happened in end of life and palliative care, particularly looking at the MENCAPS reports, the confidential inquiry, the new learning disability mortality review, which is just starting, and other research which is just coming out. So I don't know how, hopefully everyone knows about death by indifference. This was a report back in 2007 by MENCAP where they looked at six people six case studies who had died and where there had been complaints and their bottom line was that this is a national disgrace and there was institutional discrimination and the sort of things that came up was that people with learning disability were given a low priority in hospital particularly many healthcare professionals knew little about learning disability and they would not involve and listen to families and carers about what the person was trying to say or how they were. And a great deal about capacity and that healthcare professionals were not very good about capacity assessments and consent to treatment. That they tended to rely on their own estimates of people's quality of life and that also what came out was the complaint system in the NHS was pretty awful, that people were going through long, long periods of time complaining without getting anywhere. So five years on, they repeated some of this and looked at 74 deaths and found virtually the same things. Not very much had changed at all. There was still lack of basic care, there was still poor communication, there was delays in diagnosis and treatment, pain wasn't recognised, and we'll come back to that later, but the issues of someone who has communication difficulties, how you assess their pain, and by then we had the Mental Capacity Act, and there was not much understanding about that, or about do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation, DNA, CPR. And obviously, not very far away from here, is the case that came to the courts and very high profile where someone was given a DNAR form without any consultation with Down syndrome as the reason for not resuscitating. Um, interestingly, I've just been at a research meeting earlier today where the same thing has happened again in another institution where someone has just written well, it was actual mental retardation, which is worse in some ways, but certainly no better. So over a couple of years ago, there was the confidential inquiry into premature deaths. Now, this was a, a, based at the University of Bristol, and they reviewed 247 deaths in southwest England. The median age was 65 for men, 63 for women, 22% were under 50. The general population expectation of, would be 78 
for men and 83 for women. So we're looking at our 13 to 20 years reduction in life expectancy. 20% of those deaths were assessed being from cancer, 22% were circulatory disorders, 43% were unexpected, but that was the same as the general population. But 42% were assessed as being premature. There had been delays, problems in diagnosis, needs hadn't been identified, and care hadn't been appropriate. And 29% there was a delay in diagnosis, investigation, and specialist referral. So these are people again who were going into hospital and being basically ignored and not having the treatment that a member of the general population at the same age would have had. You know, if you go in with appendicitis, someone will take a blood test, if necessary do a scan, will act on that that day. There were examples of people waiting two, three, four days and they were so ill and dying of appendicitis. <coughs> There was also problems with treatment, there were problems of coordination of care, lack of recognition that someone was dying and the Mental Capacity Act wasn't being used very well. But it was at all levels. There was one case with a man who was found dead sitting in his armchair with his front door of his flat open. It went to the coroner, the post-mortem was undertaken, and it was assessed that this man had died of a fit. When they'd looked through his records, he hadn't had a fit for 25 years. And if you and I were found, or anybody else was found dead in a room with a door open, the police would have been involved, and a full investigation would have happened. The coroner just signed this off as a natural death, and that was it. So there's real evidence of mishandling in the care before and after death. So now this has brought about a Learned Disabilities Mortality Review Programme, which is to look at all deaths from learned disability, is the aim, to improve care and to reduce this premature of mortality and health inequalities. That's the aim. And that every local area should start reviewing their deaths of learning disability, trying to identify contributory factors and make action plans. That's the plan. And they've looked at the Kippold results and other mortality statistics and still come up that the age of death is 16 years on average earlier than the general population. It's increasing. The median has gone up in the last few years, but the gap between the general population and learned disability is the same. So it's not that there's a catching up, the gap is still the same. And the age standardised mortality rate is over three. So if you're of a certain age, you are three times more likely to die than someone in the general population at that age. That's a sizable difference. It's not just a little difference, it's a sizable difference. What were the causes? Again, ischemic heart disease, respiratory disease, will come, and particularly aspiration. That's where uh, there's aspiration of food or saliva onto the chest, with, re with pneumonia following this and that the cause of death. That was 21 times higher than expected. Cancer was slightly, much the same, but colon cancer seemed to be a little bit high, particularly the high one. Other cancers actually seemed to be less in, in the population. That may relate to um, the, the younger age, because cancer tends to be a, a disease of older age, and there may be less smoking, because <laughs> what's the biggest cancer, lung cancer from smoking, is a large percentage, so probably that is lower, which would reduce that cancer. Area. 
They again looked at preventable deaths and how they define preventable deaths, they're the ones that by public health measures could be stopped, you know, prevented. So that's smoking, alcohol, drunk driving, you know. And that was exactly the same in the general population and in the learning disability population. But when you look at amenable deaths, that's that could be changed by, reduced by changing the health care. 36% of those deaths were amenable to change. Whereas the general population, it was still 13%, which was a little bit worrying. You know, that's one in seven deaths might have been avoided if different care had been provided. That's quite a, a big figure. It's bigger than I expected, but it's nearly three times again greater for someone with a disability. So this review is going to happen, but it's not mandatory. But it will be in the commissioning group's outcome framework for next year. And secondary providers, the hospitals, will have funding to undertake their reviews. So I'm hoping that if someone's paying to you to do a review, if you don't do it, someone will be saying, we either want the money back or you get on and do it. But what's the sort of scales? Under 17, there were 78 deaths, approximately every year. In the next group, 2,209, and a, a smaller group, over 75. So a total of two, nearly 3,000 deaths a year. And I'd also, at the same time, I, when I was looking at some of these figures, thinking of how things had particularly changed with Down syndrome, and it's dramatic in some ways that, you know, in 1912, your average age of death was 12. Even in 1980, that's when I had finished my training, yeah, I was working as a doctor, it was 25. And now it's 50 to 60. So that's an enormous difference. And 94% of people with Down syndrome live to a year, and 88% to two years. So, you know, the, 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 there is an enormous difference. But we are more and more aware of dementia as an issue, you know, the risk increasing at a lower age than the general population. You know, I have to face the risk of dementia in my 80s, 90s, hopefully then, rather than being a man I may not get to my 80s, 90s, you know. Um, but it's less likely to be diagnosed in Downs. It seems to be more rapid, and obviously they've got communication issues. But I also thought at the same time, if we looked at all Down syndrome deaths, the majority of deaths are probably pre-delivery, i.e. Terminate, in termination. And you know the numbers of terminations are increasing. And I think that came, I hope everyone's seen the Sally Phillips TV programme, which, you know, in Iceland, there has not been a Down syndrome baby born, I think it was for two years. Every, it's not quite compulsory, but it's expected you would have a termination. Um, and I think her the programme A World with Down Syndrome was an interesting one and raises real issues. Um, I think the bit that struck me was when she was explaining to her younger son how her, the, the son with Down Syndrome might be a bit more, you know, might not react quite the same, might be angrier and might find it difficult to understand things. And the little boy who was four said, oh, just like daddy you mean. Hmm? <laughs> uh, uh, I thought that that said it all in some ways. Um, but I think there is an int a fascinating thing which that programme brought to the fore and probably you know, get, doesn't get talked of in, in the way of how we look at all deaths. It was like when Rachel and I took, we had a poster on a 
residential home. We've done a study on a residential home in Faversham that looks after elderly people with um, particularly Down syndrome, Down syndrome dementia. And we had this poster and it, you know, it was in Austria, in Vienna, the conference. And one Austrian doctor came up and said, well, of course, we don't have anyone who was born before 1946 with any learning disability because between 1932 and 1945, everyone with learning disability was sent to the camps and removed from the population. We know those facts and we sort of hear it and then, but actually have it boldly, oh, it's, oh, that's, oh, don't know quite how to react. But yeah, there is that unspoken changes. So generally, from the point of view of healthcare, there is the, a concern that people with learning disabilities will get poorer healthcare generally. They're in poorer health generally. There are real issues about treatment, and when it comes to end-of-life care, it might not be recognised, but they're real issues because of the elderly, the ageing of the population, that the parents and carers are elderly, may not be able to care or have died, and that we're looking at dementia becoming commoner and earlier. So the other interesting recent, and you won't find this in any publication, it hasn't been published yet, but I've, Stuart Todd in Cardiff has been looking at where people die and what happens around the time of death across the country. And then, um, this is a study that's been done in Southampton and Trinity College Dublin as well as South Wales. Um, it's funded by the Bailey Thomas Trust. Has anyone had funding from them? It's, they sound, if, if nothing else, the biggest thing I learned was to remember this name to look up because they fund small projects, not the sort of half a million projects, but the five, 10, 15, 25,000 projects. So, I've certainly got it down, ready to look at if I'm coming up with something. Their data collection is complete and this is their early results. There was a conference, there is an organisation, I'll never get the name right, the Palliative Care for People with Learning Disability, but there's some um, care of people with learning disability. It has the longest name of any organisation. And they have their annual conference and Stuart came and gave the figures. Now I'm very grateful to him because he's allowed me to use some of his slides. The idea was to recruit learning disability service providers across the UK, describe those settings and of who's being supported, to have a core data then on all the people who died in those settings. And that will be recorded and get details on each death plus some aversion of voices, which is a questionnaire for bereaved families, has been developed in Southampton for looking at care, palliative care, from the point of view of the bereaved families and what their remembrances of the care, what had happened at the time of death, that would be completed by a member of staff of the, of the person that they knew. And they recruited 38 providers um, in the UK, supporting 13,000 people. And over the period of nearly two years, there were 2,222 deaths. And they were able to get the results for the majority. And 89% of those they could get, 80% they could get a voices response from a carer quite amazing really because they really have got some good information hopefully. This is the plot of, of, now as you can see it tends to be England, there's quite a few in Wales because of the Welsh, there's some in Scotland, there's n very little in Northern Ireland because there was a similar, a, a different study going on at the same time so they couldn't try and recruit. But a spread across the whole of England so it's not just one area. There were people in registered care homes with an average of seven people per setting and in supported living services. 
and the, there are a few known disability nursing homes. That's where nursing home means you have to have a nurse and increased care. So that's increasing. So there were again some settings there, but the you know, the majority were in supported living services. And that was the deaths. They were, uh, and the group. There were a lot of people in their 40s to 60s, and then it decreased in, as you got more elderly. However, they know at the same time, this study is looking at people with learning disabilities dying in residential homes, not specific learning disability residential homes, but general residential homes. And this is a completely different group. <laughs> the people in residential homes are die, uh, people in their 70s, 80s. So the people in the, um, are, it looks as if people are moving from supported living, from learning disability residential homes to other residential homes. Particularly, I think, from supported living to residential homes. So 216 people died in that period. So it's 11.3 deaths per 1,000 residents. So it means if you are a supported living home with five people, it's not very common <laughs> that someone dies. And I think that's one of the issues. In a residential home, it's slightly commoner because the numbers are bigger. Um, but it's very few and I think that's one of the biggest issues and I know in palliative care we've always there's been a move to say oh, we'd educate people about end-of-life care and palliative care so they're ready for a particular area that they might not have someone dying for another five or ten years and you know that the staff in five years are not going to be the staff you're educating now. So it has to be much more instantaneous and acting when there is a problem and when someone's dying. Um, I think there is, it can't be by general education. There can be some educational things just to get people's awareness, but we can't educate all supporting living um, homes to be aware and ready for the person who dies because it may not happen for years. The slightly more men than female, the age 61. Interestingly, exact, nearly exactly the same for both groups. 74% of people were under 70 and 20% were under 50. Again, very showing this younger group or shift, shifting basically everything 15 to 20 years earlier than the general population. And I think that's very clearly shown on, on that way. You can see the, the red boxes are from the study um, and the blue is from a general population. You know, you're looking at a very different system. People are dying much younger. Um, Deaths 18 to 59 are rare in the general population overall. They are looked at whether the death was expected. Now, overall, they reckon, looking at other studies, about 60% of people who die, it may be expected. You know, like when my mother died two years ago, who was 94 with heart disease, diabetes, dementia. You know, I wasn't too shocked when she died, you know, we expect it. Hmm? Overall, for this population, 36% of the staff said this was an expected death. For Downs, it was higher. It was virtually the same as the general population. People looking after someone with Down syndrome were saying, oh yes, we could see a change. If it wasn't Down syndrome, it was definitely people weren't um, aware. Care homes and shelter living were much the same. 
I didn't say at the beginning, if there are things, do come back if you're going, or that doesn't fit. Does that sort of seem reasonable? But if we, interestingly, if we see the normal setting as the place of death, so for the general population, you know, they live at home or in a residential home and they die there, about 43% of people do. Overall, it was slightly higher, much higher in Down syndrome. They were able to stay in their supported living or their residential home. In care homes, it was slightly higher than in supported living. And I'll come back to that in a moment. There was a, a, an aspect to that. But there was, if people, you know, they were not all dying where they probably wished to die. Certainly, having seen the previous studies, hospital is not the place to be if you're dying for any person, you often, but for someone with learned disabilities where the staff aren't understanding, there are new carers who they don't know, the person doesn't know, the staff are changing continuously, it's a busy ward, it's not an ideal place for someone to be. So it would be hopefully we should be trying to get more people to be able to stay in their supported living or the residential home where they're known, everyone knows what's happening and can support them. And interestingly, if you look at the, whether they were expected to die or not expected to die, you were more, if you were expected to die, you were much more likely to die in the place that you probably wanted to be in your normal setting much Down syndrome again, even more so. Care homes higher. For sheltered living it was low, it was much lower. Big difference. And we'll, I'll show, I think the next slide says, suggests why that might be. In a residential home there are 3.7 re staff members working with an average of 7.8 residents. In the uh, supported living it was 2.1 with 3.2 however if the staff size was less than one to one there were much higher hospital deaths if it was lower they were much like more likely to die where they were and I think uh, the way I can rationalize and the way they were looking at it is you are the carer in a setup with three or four people, something happens, you're frightened, you call 999. Mm. If there are two people there, you look at the other and say, What shall we do? Shall we call someone for help, or do we call a manager? Do we call someone? Shall we cope tonight and ring, to ring the, someone tomorrow morning? And it's more settled. This may be a real stimulus to think of how staffing levels are sorted out. You know, do we need to ensure if, that there is more su support for carers? And I think that's something in health and social care we're not very good at support for carers. I always say doctors have no problem with stress. British doctors have no problems with stress. We have the highest suicide rate highest alcohol rate, a very high divorce rate, and drug taking. Hmm? But we have no problems with stress at all. Yeah. We don't actually in health and social care think about support of, of carers very well. I think there is more in social than health care. Um, I'm always interested when I go outside any hospital, particularly now, the site is now becoming non-smoking, that you can find a large number of nurses, porters, other people, doctors, all sitting there, standing mm -hmm. outside having a, a quick smoke before they go back on duty. But in so, do we support people in social care? Particularly about death and dying. You know, coping with someone who's dying for a, perhaps a person who hasn't seen a dead body, hasn't experienced any of this before, is very frightening. 
and the default position is pick up the phone 999. And the other interesting thing was, did people know they were dying with their disability? Expect eight percent, probably seventeen percent. Not very common, particularly if it was an unexpected death. They were even less likely to. But for people with expected deaths, twenty-seven percent with support needs and communication knew or probably knew but if they had real communication issues it was much lower so is that the person didn't want to know or didn't wasn't able to understand or was it that people wouldn't weren't able to spend that extra time to cope with the communication issues to discuss those issues it wasn't a significant difference because it was quite small numbers but it's a a question mark, I think, of how do we cope? And interestingly, if the person was reported to have known they were dying, the staff around 75% were happy with that and thought it was right. If the person didn't know, 90% of the staff thought that was right as well. <laughs> so, ah, and if the person knew the person well, the they probably knew the diagnosis and cancer was much more likely to have been discussed than lung cancer. But is that the sort of still the we know best and we won't discuss these things? I don't know. It's, I think we raise questions that actually are some discussions not happening but it probably reflects general society hmm? of, you know, we don't talk about death and dying. Hmm? We don't talk. I did a lecture to a whole group of chest physicians, respiratory physicians, chest physicians, and said, you know, how many of you made your will? And there were 100 people, about half a dozen hands went up. Hmm? And the professor of professor who was there the next morning emailed me and said I've made an appointment to see the solicitor tomorrow mm -hmm. I've been going to do it tomorrow for the last 10 years because mm -hmm. there's that sort of all of us as a you know, if I make my will I'm going to die tomorrow you know, I'll make it on Wednesday and I'll die Thursday because it's sort of magical mm -hmm. and 25% uh, of GPs haven't made a will so, you know, how are they going to talk about death and dying if they've not actually accepted themselves? And we're not very good. There's a lot more discussion about advanced care planning or having a power of attorney for the general population, but it's still very small. Whereas there was a study from um, the States where a hospice said they were really very upset because the number of people coming into the hospice with an advanced directive had dropped to 90%. wasn't that bad. At the Wisdom Hospice where I was, it was 0.9% on a good day hmm? because people don't talk about it. But there is some evidence that perhaps there's even more. It's easier not than to talk about these difficult issues that people may want to. In the last few minutes I'd just like to say about, a bit about palliative care and how I feel we could help. This is the World Health Definition, uh, Organisation Definition of Palliative Care. It's a bit like an exam question. You know, a committee spent four years working over every word of this. Hmm? So it's an approach that improves quality of life of patients and their families, facing problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering, the early identification and impeccable assessment. Now, I think I know who put impeccable in there. I had great problems explaining impeccable to a group of Polish doctors. And actually, if you went down to Canterbury High Street and asked 100 people what impeccable meant, you'd probably get some interesting, but the very it's the very careful listening, working out exactly what's happening, but 
it's, it is a word, but I don't think it's the best of words for an international definition. And treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial and spiritual. So we're looking at the whole patient, so we're looking at physical aspects, but are looking at psychosocial, psychological, the fears, the social, how most of us are part of families, and even the person in a learned disability um, unit may be, is part of that family with the other residents and the carers. We look at the patient in the context of that family, we're looking at family and we're trying to help professionals be aware as well. So it is looking at the physical things like symptoms, like mobility, the fears, the social aspects, and the spiritual. Now, spiritual, I know Precious gave, was it last time, was Precious talking about the, her research on spiritual care. Um, and there's great debates about what spiritual care is. You know, is it religious? Is it, you know, get a priest in to do the, you know, do the anointing and the holy bits? Or is it something deeper? I think it's something much deeper than that. It's, I always think that um, Claire Short, the MP, who some of you remember had a lot about, was always campaigning against page three and the sun, was on the Death Style and Discs many years ago talking about the death of her husband and I think the death of her father and said, I've never believed in God, I don't believe in God now, I can't say I ever will believe in God, but when my husband died, I blame God. And there's that sort of deeper spirituality that people may have that may not be religious as such, but is there. And it may be I would like Beethoven's Sixth Symphony to be playing while I'm dying, or poetry. Or it may be I want Black Sabbath playing while I'm getting ill and dying. We always found that a bit difficult in the hospice if people wanted too dramatic music. But, um, but it may be those, deep, those, those aspects as much as religion, but it might be religion. And it may be the fears and I think what came out with Precious's research wasn't it that spiritual issues were important and sometimes it was going to church although going to church might be you got tea and biscuits at the end which was the high point but it might be just being with other people hmm? it might be wanting to talk about some deeper issues and it may be wanting to talk about death and dying and that may be how am I going to die but it might be what's going to happen afterwards. Now, I haven't got an answer to the what's going to happen afterwards, but at least we can talk about it. And pain is a particular problem. Palliative care has always been involved in pain control. It's a particular problem in learning disability if someone has communication issues. How do you know someone's in pain? And studies have shown it's not uncommon. Chronic pain was 13% of patients on a, when they really assess pain. 2% had three different pains. But it might be described in different ways or not described at all, or it may be in behavior. Again, when they did other questionnaires, 60% of, 67% of people said they had pain, but they hadn't told anyone. And nurses and carers were assessing pain from physiological changes and behaviour. Yeah, it may not be possible to ask the person. We always say, how do you know if someone's got pain? You ask them and they say they have pain. That means they've got pain. But that person may not understand or be able to communicate that. So that's why there is a, a system called DISDAT. People come across DISDAT. Yeah, I mean, it's... And what it is, is to get the carers to say, when, how do you know this person's distressed? So, you know, if he's tapping his head, I know he's distressed. Or he goes a funny colour, he goes bright red, we know he's distressed. And then to write that down and get carers to really think through. So that when those sim that signs come, someone can say, look, he is distressed. We've got to work out why. Is it 
something else, are they in pain? And it's actually, if they are in pain, it might be, let's give some painkillers and see if that distress in the behaviour improves. And the research has shown it was difficult. There were lots of cues, but this did enable particularly carers and nurses to say, look, we think, doctor, he's in pain. You know, listen to us. There were in those MENCAP death by indifference people who had been in hospital with severe pain for days with everyone saying it's just gastroenteritis. And then when the perforated appendix was found and the person died, oh, perhaps he did have pain. Yeah, that's too late. So it's giving people a chance to advocate for things. And I think we did a little study in, in Kent a few years ago, Rachel and um, we did a study where we looked, went to focus groups in hospices and in their disability teams. And the what came out was palliative care wasn't very sure about intellectual disability. 17% had had some training. I, at my medical school there was a half, half day and I missed the train that went to the big, it was in the days when there were the big institutions, I missed the train so I never got there. That was it. Nurses, it was slightly higher. There were fears in hospices about challenging behaviour. What's it going to be like? We're going to have problems. There were real concerns about communication. How, nurses say, how do I give an injection if I can't get, you know, I'm not sure if the person's understanding what I'm going to do to them, which is understandable. There were, was appreciation of carers' needs, but most hospices and palliative care teams had seen very few people. There were communication issues came out from both teams, trying to understand what their needs were and trying to make sure that the wishes of someone came out. Did we recognise the pain? In some places, people said, yeah, we've heard about this stat, we use that, and others, people said, what? What's that? And all the time, there were these behavioural changes, maybe masking symptoms. There were the issues of pain assessment, trying to understand and involve carers who might know that person really well. Um, but also, in learning disability services, having carers to, you know, to say, this person, we need to have some bit of extra help. We aren't coping very well with this, these problems. Yes, we'd welcome palliative care. And there was a fear that, oh, if we get the hospice in, they'll be taken off somewhere. And we were saying, no, no, we want to help and work with you. The usual aspects of time, you know. As a nurse, community nurse, I have, you know, a half an hour or an hour maximum to go and see someone at home. And I've only really scratched the surface in that time. I need a half day with that patient. And that actually were doctors and nurses and hospice staff just the same as the general population of, you know, what is the disability? They've all got very poor quality of life, so why are we doing things? And that came over. That there was late diagnosis of disease, there wasn't a lack of understanding. And particularly in hospitals, there was a lack of understanding of what learning disability meant and how things would need to change and altering treatment um, options. And I think there were two aspects to that. There was some where, oh, we won't bother to treat that person. Or there was another group, because we don't want to be seen as you know, discriminating, we'll give everything more than we would to the same person of the, with outlearned disability. So that someone might have more investigations or more treatment than they were able to tolerate or cope with. But there was also the learning disability staff not knowing much about palliative care. Decision making obviously was difficult. How do we, who do we listen to, which carers, which family members? And also something that came up is that people may, particularly have been at home with parents, 
had not made any decisions. Uh, somebody said that person's been wrapped up in cotton wool all his life and then suddenly we're, you know, do you want to have chemotherapy or surgery? And he actually, his mum produced his blue shirt on Mondays and green shirt on Wednesdays and, you know, he hadn't made any decisions himself. And then being faced with these decisions. And then finally, where are we going? The other thing I wanted to share, the European Association of Palliative Care, which I'm on the board of, actually has produced a white paper on palliative care in learning disability, intellectual disability. I was the board representative for that group. Um, Irina Tuffrey winge is the person who is, for, hope, if, anyone, if you look up end of life or palliative care in learning disability, her name will come up. Um, she has been advocating left, right and centre for years. But this was a big international group. And the sorts of things that came out of what we've been saying already, that access to palliative care is human right for everyone, including people with a disability. All people should have high quality care. That people with a disability have the same right to holistic care, looking at all their needs that palliative care should be available and the needs are um, similar, that the presence of learning disability may be challenges on timing, on enabling, helping people to communicate, but it should be a challenge, not a barrier. And services may need to adjust care to individual needs, and that's a challenge in the NHS and social care in 2016 when everything is being cut, how do you have it individual? Well, it came out with like, like with breast screening. You know. Breast screening clinics have six minutes per person. Hmm? Six minutes might allow the person to get into the screening unit. <laughs> it will take another 25 minutes to get undressed and another 25 minutes to explain and undergo, you know. And all that's happening is there's frazzled, anxious, angry staff because they're seeing the queue building up outside and no one's thought of actually allowing extra time. And care and support should be available for family, friends and carers. So, what are we thinking of? We need to be looking at the care through the treatment, we need to be helping people with symptoms, always thinking of the psychological, social and spiritual. And that, you know, what happens when in a supported living unit there are four people, one is becomes ill and dies? How is that discussed with the other? How are the staff who have been looking after that person for a long period of time? supported in bereavement. So, interesting issues. How do we talk, support someone with spiritual care? And all the time, as I say, thinking of patient, family and staff. Open to you for questions. Okay, thank you. Mm. <laughs> I can't move. <laughs>